let's just start. I think most of the listeners will be aware of the difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system because my audience is super sharp and savvy, but let's just yeah. go over that as a review. So what are we yeah. doing? Why do we care about this? Why would we want to modify our breath? Like, what is the big deal? How is our nervous system going to change? And let's talk a little bit about these two kind of sides of the coin of the nervous system or the autonomic yeah. nervous system. Yeah. I mean, fu fundamentally speaking, the, you know, the, the easiest place to start for, for anybody and what we really did, we, 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 we teach from a first principle standpoint. It's really like, Hey, what's like, let's lay this down. What's the difference between nose and mouth breathing? You've got two or two or an anatomical structures that can bring air in and out. What's the difference between those two? And it turns out the mouth is directly involved with sympathetic activity. So the moment I begin to talk after you're done talking, I, I am now, there are physiological things that are actually occurring as a result of me breathing through my mouth, right? And one of those is a higher arousal or more sympathetic activity. Now, in today's day and age, we live in a world, maybe not you down in Costa Rica right now, but um, we live in a world that is highly driven for more and success as a means of doing more, right? Making more money, doing more, all of this shit that we've created that we think is how life should run. What we gave up a long time ago was what animals did not in the wild. And they are very in tune with their nervous system where we are not. We have moved into kind of this mid range stage of sympathetic activity most of our day. And we think that that's the okay place to function. I did, um, I've been there for quite, like I've done all of this stuff. I don't speak about anything I've never participated in or had an experience with. Um, but, but if you take for instance, like, a like we usually tell a story of like I'll, I'll give another story so you take an animal that's lost its herd right like consider a gazelle lost the herd that animal ain't sleeping that night that animal is on full alert for quite some time right until it finds its herd what happens when it finds its herd down shifts immediately it's able to sleep it's able to partake in regular life it poops it eats it goes back to its stuff we do not right we our environment isn't really something that's unstable but we create a very unstable place within that drive to do more and i really think the drive to do more based on the work that i've real that we're really deep in right now the busy mentality is the biggest cover-up for not dealing with what people are really needing to understand about themselves they don't want to see the reality of who they are or deal with the reasons why they might be anxious, why they might be unhappy, and the things that they're actually motivated by. These are the foundations of meditation. That is exactly what those three things that I just laid out are the foundations of meditation. But what also lies beneath with meditation is a breath practice at every single fundamental level in any major meditative practice is breath work. And the reason breath work falls into this is because the moment I move from that yapping my mouth and you begin to talk, I should drop into breathing through my nose. And when I do that, I instantly calm down. Why? Well, my diaphragm is now engaged better. It's not that it's never working. And this is a big misnomer and we can go over this in a little bit, but the, the idea of diaphragmatic breathing, I've got it. I'm really working on getting PTs and DPTs, like the whole physical therapy community to stop talking like this because there's no such thing as not diaphragmatic breathing. If you didn't diaphragmatically breathe, you'd be on an, an iron lung. It's called Odin's curse. It's a, it's the, where the phrenic nerve doesn't work. Okay. We're using it. It's just, we may be in a really poor position. And when we breathe through the nose, I'm actually pulling that diaphragm down deeper, which allows me to get into lower lobes where there's more parasympathetic nerves, where I'm, uh, um, I'm actually diffusing more CO2 and O2. So we've got better diffusion, right? So we've got all this stuff occurring that should typically be occurring all the time. But unfortunately, because of the lives we're living, we're now seeing that respiration rates are now going way up right? Like in the medical world, I'm getting this back from a lot of nurses and doctors right now. 
the normal range for breathing is 17 to 20 breaths a day. That is almost, that is 29,000 breaths a day. That is hyperventilation, which when I hyperventilate, this is, so we go back to the mouth. If I'm breathing through my mouth, I'm not absorbing as much O2 into the system to, I can't diffuse as much, right? And I offload that O2, but I also am offloading excessive carbon dioxide when there's no metabolic demand. So if my energy, if my, if I'm not working out push-ups, moving around more, the metabolic demand is, isn't requiring me to open my mouth. I'm now offloading more carbon dioxide, which ruins, principally speaking, the dissociative effect that happens between carbon dioxide and oxygen, meaning bioavailability of oxygen to the process you just described in the electron transport chain. Oxygen actually is a very dense, like crazy molecule that rips and tears apart and steals things but it's the way we use to break down substrates and, and coax these enzymatic processes to work for substrate utilization, right? And so if I am over breathing, I now move myself into more sympathetic activity and using more anaerobic processes than necessary because the oxygen is not there. There's some, but it's not totally there. And so how efficient am I at that? And this is where breath control really comes in. There's a lot that you just talked about that we can unpack <laughs> and go deep. I love it. So yes, the, the last thing you were talking about is, is a really interesting nuance of, of human respiratory physiology with the blood. And we need to remember that oxygen comes in through our nose or mouth. You talked about the di dichotomy there. It goes into the lungs, which have lobes. They're not just one mm -hmm. single bag. They're multiple lobes. Mm -hmm. And because of gravity, the lower lobes of the lungs have more blood running through them. And there is a differential ability of oxygen to move across the very thin endothelium of the inside of our lungs, which are called alveoli, and move into the blood. It's incredible. What When we take a breath, we are taking something, these gases from the exterior environment and moving them into our body. It's like our lungs are eating the air in a way, but it's just moving across a membrane in the alveoli. And then it's going from obviously the venous circulation to an arterial circulation, or it's, it's moving. And there's, there's a lot happening there. And the different parts of the lungs affect uh, oxygen yeah. transfer differently mm -hmm. and CO2 exchange because oxygen is going in and CO2 is going out. And so I love what you're saying there that we have put ourselves, and I talked about this a little bit recently, into a human zoo into an environment that is a bad human zoo. <laughs> I did a podcast with Chris Ryan a few weeks ago and we talked about constructing the most compatible human zoo that we could, the human zoo that most closely mirrors what our wild quote ancestors might have done. But we're, we're in this environment where people are over busy, they are overburdened and we are over breathing because we're so stressed all the time. Yes. And as yes. you're suggesting that has massively mm -hmm. bad implications yeah. For, yeah. for our physiology.